Buonasera a tutte e a tutti, grazie per essere qui. Calispera se olus, che sa se caristume, ui se se do. Good evening and thank you for being here at this speech this evening. And I'm very happy to see a lot of people tonight. And uh, thank you to, yes, uh, to those who are connected on Zoom for any technical problems and for the following question, please write in chat, it's okay. So we are arrived at the third appointment of this so-called uh, seminars of the third floors. In reality, an occasion uh, to knowledge, uh, to um, uh, share information and uh, meet other scholars aimed at uh, schools scholars. So, um, I thank you for Italian uh, school, uh, archaeological school at Athens for uh, the person of the director, uh, Professor Emanuele Papi, uh, for the possibility to organize this event and for the refreshment we will have at the end. Thank you to my colleagues for uh, this common adventure here. And thank you above all to Dr. Giulica Cristacopoulou, who immediately accepted uh, this invitation to speak to us about the first Iron Age necropolis of Stamna in Etolia, Carmenia. Uh, briefly, uh, what about uh, Julika? She uh, holds a degree in history and archaeology uh, from Ioannina University and then a PhD from uh, the National Capodistrian University at Athens. And now she is a curator of antiquities, uh, the Aphorate of Antiquities uh, uh, in Achaia, um, Minister of Hellenic, uh, Minister uh, of Culture and Sports. And in her studies, she had um, uh, dedicated a lot of importance to uh, rituals, uh, funerary rituals, to uh, architecture of the burials, uh, examining uh, through these elements uh, the, the construction of individual and the collective memory, uh, above all uh, proto-geometric period and uh, in uh, Western and Northwestern Greece. But I need to say she's also a kind researcher because when I wrote to her to have uh, uh, more information about the stand, uh, she as soon as possible gave to me uh, every information she sent to me, her materials not yet published. So for me, it was very important. And uh, what about Stamna Necropolis? Stamna is a, a very uh, important context of proto geometric period uh, for uh, the um, complexity of uh, funerary ritual for the variability of uh, typology of the graves for some objects. Uh, so it's uh, very uh, important to understand uh, how is the, the, the ritual. And uh, also for its extent excavation, we have uh, more of uh, 500 burials and uh, it found the textiles uh, around the uh, bronze calderon. They gave uh, more importance uh, to the preservation of bronze vessels. So um, at the end of Mycenaean uh, palaces in the late Ladic 3C, uh, for example, in the Western Greece, um, we saw uh, an important moment of growth, a sort of a golden age instead a uh, dark one. And uh, for example, in Achaia, but not only there, uh, we, we can observe the phenomenon uh, of the increase of uh, foreigners' objects and foreigners' models, uh, the so-called uh, the controversial uh, uh, metallurgical coiné. Uh, so it's important to understand better uh, how uh, and what uh, it happens in the so-called uh, uh, peripheral uh, area. Um, and then, uh, uh, according to some scholars, uh, 
Uh, what happens in late Ladic 3C, middle and late in Western Greece happens with a, a certain delay, a certain continuity in proto-geometric um, Northern uh, Greece. So we need to understand how it works. Um, so the first question is to understand better um, the construction of a funerary ideology uh, as expression of a sort of a social political articulation in this period. And then the second question is the position of stamina settlement in those uh, movements of people and objects that uh, affected the Adriatic and Balkan coast in the first Iron Age. Uh, so uh, with this uh, introduction, I would like to give you some insight for the subsequent uh, um, discussion. So I leave uh, the floor to Dr. Krista Kopulu. And I remember uh, in uh, the 15th of December, another seminar we will have with uh, um, Dr. Sofia Zumbabi. So we'll hold this, please, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's a privilege for me to come and talk with you tonight. Uh, I wear my glasses because I can't see anything. And um, well, uh, for my speech, um, I'll try to answer to the first question because the one that has to do with the origin uh, of the people uh, of Stamna, it's a tough question. And uh, if you want, you we can talk about the origin after the speech. So let me begin. Okay, I let, ah, this one, no, you have to help me in order, oh, that's, okay. I will start the speech with a short discussion directly related to the title. Mr. Ray states, I think funerals are outdated and a waste of time. Mr. B replies, actually funerals are important rituals in a grieving process. They do not just recognize that life is ended, but also that life was lived. Even today, memories are saved by stories. From local communities to nations, the stories we tell will save what we, we will remember about the past. So today, we will try to focus on saving biographies from who saved life through death from well-used and unused cooking ware through sharpened and dulled weaponry prior to their final deposition. Let's begin our story about the Stamna territory. Stamna is a village and a community in the municipal unit of Otoliko in the southern part. Let me. Part of Etolia Carnania, Greece. It is located on a chain of low hills that separate the river Helos to the west from the Bay of Otolico at the southeast. I think I have a problem with um, the photos. So someone has to help me. Ah, okay. There is Tamna, there is Otolico Lagoon. But what does the word stamina mean? The story of stamina as a vessel starts from the middle Neolithic period when it was created for the transportation and storage of liquids. The stamina had multiple uses and shapes according to different occasions. It was used for saving the water, wine, or oil. The word stamina comes from the Byzantine stamion, 
the root of which is the ancient Greek verb isthmi, which means that it could start up by itself. The finding of a huge number of ancient clay vessels, as we will see, presupposes the existence of local workshops and justifies the name of the region in later years, as the stamina name was given to describe a later pottery production. The location is seen to be of extreme strategic importance due to the fact that since it is located at the part where the Tolico Lagoon is at its deepest, it controlled the entire length of the lagoon shoreline. This fact, on the one hand, made it accessible for the people of Stamna themselves, but on the other hand, the area was under their complete control for whoever in the award to enter its pass. They would find themselves trapped and defenseless while being attacked from both sides of the shoreline under control. The area under study does not present sufficient evidence that to help us determine a residential model and corresponding evidence for the social structure of the settlement. The excavation data for the sites under study concerns only cemeteries, the area of which is quite significant. It exceeds eight kilometers in length and follows the route of the modern bypass highway. The barrier clusters reflect satellite residential sites belonging to a central settlement, which in this case is located near the plots, the plots of Costa Dimas and Cusaridas, with uh, the yellow spot, you can see it, whose barrier cluster is the only one that contains overlapping levels of graves. The assemblance of stamina pottery includes all known vessels. Those are distinguished by a number of construction and decoration details that differentiate them from other ceramic productions. Characteristic is that the protogeometric ceramists attempt to combine the Mycenaean vessel shape following a slight version in modeling with modern decorative motifs, thus creating a unique tradition so that the term protogeometric Aetolian style can be safely applied to the ceramic groups under study. Beyond the specialized and original barrier structures, we must mention the fact that at the Stamna Cemetery, a percentage over 60% of Pithos barriers were found. Pithos barriers were found in situ, placed horizontally on the ground, most of them well preserved. Most characteristic is the case of the Pithos 372, where the pots were placed over the belly in a chain arrangement. A percentage of 20% of carefully constructed graves belong to the cyst grave type. The walls and the covering of the cysts were made up of single limestone and such stone slabs, while the floor usually was formed by small pebble slabs and a combination of slabs and pebbles together. With regard to cyst graves, the type was already known in Mycenaean times, as evidenced by the find of the cyst grave at the site of Kubara which contained bronze weapons, a bronze tripod cauldron, ceramic vessels, and a gold helix. In one case, a large Mycenaean tolos tube was reused. In the center of the burial chamber, a cis grave was placed that contained a chief burial of the protogeometric settlement in order to emphasize the direct social relationship of the deceased with the grave's previous Occupants. The type of the grave showed also the role of the disease in the social political organization of the region. A bronze leaf shaped spearhead was found outside the job, while the disease was found wearing a ring. It should also be noted that Mycenaean polish tubes that are dated to the period 1450 until 1150 BC have been identified and studied on the nearby Pethidis. Ilias here. What about the abstract tube? Single groomed, built up, ellipsoidal pit without an entrance, one narrow side of which forms an earth. The pit is made up of flattened limestone in superimposed layers with no biting material. Inside the earth, there is a built up bench. The floor of the tube is covered with pebbles. The tube is covered with a monolithic limestone slab. 
The abstract tube does possess a monumental form, but its architectural elements, dome and bends, are integrated into the basic features of photogeometric domestic architecture. Regarding its use, unlike a Tholos tube that was intended to contain all members of a noble Mycenaean person's family, the goal here was to create an individual monument top, which nevertheless in due time incorporated the role of a Tholos tube without this being its original intention or prospect. Apart from the buried deceased person for whom the tube was originally constructed, it also contained cremations laid in a tribe of pithos and two amphorae, these two ones. And uh, the one you can see right here, number six, um, uh, had a cremated uh, person uh, that accompanied by weapons, a rationale which pointed at the high rank officer. More specifically, Of particular importance is the aphora number six, the one I saw you at the right, near the northeast side wall. I don't know if that was. Yes, just right here. Okay. This broken 400 vessel containing a cremation was uncovered in a thin layer of fire. Most of the cells were found scattered in the barrier layer. This disturbance was due to the later placement in approximately the same area of the tripod pithos mentioned above. So you will see uh, the tripod pithos and underneath the tripod the pithos, there was uh, this uh, amphora. So the presence of two disturbed layers of stones running in an arch path was characteristic and was interpreted as an attempt to isolate a small section within the abstract tube for the placement of the amphora. This section had in fact been covered with small covering slabs of material, apparently taken from the covering slabs of the funerary monument. Despite the later intervention, the upper part of the amphora was preserved in the demarcated area near which an iron sword was found that originally must have been bent around the neck of the amphora, as well as a bronze seal post, which probably served as its lid. The burial was also accompanied by a small bronze pendant. In the case of the abstract chop of Stamna, it is likely that the chop copies the chief's residence or better, his burial residence, an element already known in Mycenaean times. The combination of an abs and the big bends in the interior of the tube possibly emphasizes the power and the social status of the sentiment's chief as an expression of dominance and wealth that had both a practical and a symbolic function. Not a single similar tube has been found elsewhere, according to the literature published to date. A relatively similar but destroyed tube was found again in the Stamna region but without a bend. The built south for us built a lightweight which contained either tripod pithos or bone safe tripod vessel or bronze pageants constitutes a hybrid type of tooth and burial. Its rationale compares the monumentality rendered by the Mycenaean tube, which contained inhumations with a single presentation of a pithoid type of vessel in which only one cremation is contained. All this with inspiringly limited structure that resembles a well. Of particular interest is grave 66b, where around the pithos, most specifically within the void space between the pithos feet and the wall of the pit, among an iron spearhead, an iron sword and a large iron pin were found, a barrier practice remains in from a parallel of
323. Okay, this is the alpha yeah. One, two, three, uh, four layers of objects, and finally a pile of stone. And what about the bronze patterns? Undoubtedly, the most impressive finds of the cemetery include the bronze cauldrons, especially of the barriers 370A and 587. These specific graves contain two cauldrons, one of which served as a base and the other as a lid, and were used as a single urn enclosed within a built well safe structure and a simple cist. Inside the cauldrons of 370, a, this is 370A. A thickly woven cloth was found which covered the entire contents of the urn. Right here. While a thinner cloth had covered the iron weaponry of the deceased. In here. In the other case of the other cauldrons, at least five different layers of fabrics covered the upper cauldron. In Stamma, two more graves were investigated that contained a bronze basin with a woven basket and a bronze cauldron. All the cauldrons found within these graves, one, two, three, and four, were associated with fabric. They contained a cremated bed, with the exception of this cauldron, the last one, Whose dead was not cremated, but they had been placed in a strongly restrained position in order to a pretty narrow space. Uh, is there a problem with uh, the Zoom? Because I hear my voice in it. No, okay. What about the weapons in Caldrons? Chose three. Okay, were dyed with a purple dye derived from the sea snail murex. Based on this finding and according to the literature, the researchers claim that the standard textile finds are thus so far the oldest archaeological evidence of textiles dyed with murex in Europe and the Mediterranean area. The type of fabrics used for these cauldrons are probably related to clothing. Purple Newix dye that was used for fabrics in the Mycenaean palaces and attested on two linear B tablets of Knossos is undoubtedly strong evidence for the identity of the owners of the tubes as the elite of the elite of the Stamna territory. The weapons. The offensive and def defensive weaponry of the graves in the Stamna cemetery included 10 iron swords. 10 iron swords and one bronze, six iron dodgers, 21 spearheads, two arrowheads, and two silboses. Of the 58 knives found, excluding those found along with weaponry, to the same used as tools. So, swords. And dodgers. Of particular interest is the group of swords and dodgers found in the cemetery of Stamna, which consists of nine types of swords and five types of dodgers. In the category of the iron swords, one, two, I can see from this place, one, two, six, seven, and eight, and the dodger, two point two. In those slides, we identify the shape of the now two types of swords. None of the iron examples were preserved intact due to the advanced corrosion of their construction material. 
They live sometimes decorated with wood and sometimes with bone were not preserved either. In specific examples, horseshoe shaped iron decoration is evidenced that indicates that these holes were placed in seeds of perishable material. As we do not have enough time at our disposal, we mentioned the most outstanding types. The hilt of this word from the abstract tube could be considered characteristic, if not peculiar, as the tongue of the hilt extends significantly above its eddings. It is considered the earliest of all the, the iron eggs, sword irons in stamina. The bronze one is the only now two types for the stamina that attests to the continuation of the tradition of manufacture from the Mycenaean period, as all the others found are made of iron. This type finds a relatively similar one in iron with a slight difference in the top of the hip in type number one of stamina, which is chronologically assigned to the late Proto-Geometric period. As far as the dating of these words is concerned, according to the ceramic co findings of the weaponry, we place them respectively in the late photogeometric period, with the exception of the sword found in the abstract tube, that is the earliest iron sword of stamina. The same reasoning is followed according to the dating of Dutchess. Among them, the one found at this top, 322, this is. Uh, the top. Uh, this data is characteristic as the ellipsoidal section of its hilt may allow us to classify it as a distant form of a badger knife. The majority of the swords of stamina were associated with other weapons and more often with knives. And in three cases, one, two, and three, they were found together with spearheads, while the first one, the first one, was also associated with a silver. The total presence of now two types was in stamina, but of copper and iron, is outstanding if one counts the total number of swords nationwide. 16 copper swords have been found in neighboring Achaia, while this number has been found in total on a nationwide scale. The importance of the typology of now in two swords as a compatible argument of military officers at the, the Mykinaean, the Mycenaean period, imported from the Central Mediterranean and especially the Italian peninsula, has already been discussed among others by entering Jung and Dolce Jung and Mehofer, an aspect that could be also taken seriously in stamina considering co findings of personal use which are described as being of Italian typology. Spearheads. 21 spearheads were found, 14 of which are made of iron and seven from copper. So, first we can see the iron ones. Their deformation due to corrosion makes it impossible to classify them in the already known categories of snowgrass, with the exception of spearheads seven and eight which were preserved in a comparatively better condition. In particular, the former belongs to type E3 of Snodgrass, which he mentions as having a long lifespan, while the latter belongs to type B of Snodgrass. This latter type is quite widespread in the Danubian regions, as many parallel types that are dated back to the Bronze Age were found in Hungary, as well as in Italy in bronze. Bronze perfects. Taking into account the wide morphological variety of the types of the spearheads of stamina, it becomes clear that the weaponry belonged to the inhabitants, at least as far as bronze is concerned, was a relic of frequent wide origin and manufacture with emphasis on the north. Considering their co findings, the spearheads of stamina were deposited in late geometric period graves, with the exception of the spearhead of the pilt adds tube deposited in the early protogeometric period and that of grave 35 that is dated to the sub early protogeometric period. The excavation data show that spears are usually deposited together with other objects of weaponry such as 
for example, with swords, with knives and swords, in this case, with a bent sword and a bronze silk bows, and with knives. And what about knives? 58 iron knives were found in the cemetery of Stamna. In some graves, they were found together with weapons, but in the vast majority of graves, they were found with objects that were not related to weaponry. In this case, they are classified the category of cutting tools. Two types of doubt. The first one is this one includes this sickle shaped knife. This type of knives also occurred at Vitsa, but they are dated back to a later period than the knife of Stamna. According to Ilya Kotopoulou, the Vitsa's knives were found in male graves along with other weapons, usually a pair of arrowheads. Manon Sandronikos argues about the deposition as objects associated exclusively to weaponry, whether found alone or with weapons. Also characteristic is that type. Because of its length, this knife could also be classified in the category of dodgers and in particular in the Pescara dodger type. It's a unique find, the so far study material of the ancient cemetery and can be added in a group of individual objects of Italian typology found at Stamna. Arrowheads. They are rare in the cemetery of Stamna, as only two were found. In general, arrowheads are rare to find, especially in mainland Greece, while the use as funerary offerings already from the Mycenaean period is not particularly common. Symbols. They are considered one of the rarest and at the same time, one of the most remarkable findings in the cemetery of Stamna. These are the symbols from the one was found outside the sixth grave uh, 135 that uh, was opened in antiquity probably probably by uh, looters. In the case of uh, the silk bows found at the upstart tube, its size, in combination with the whole scene of its discovery, the air, the cremation remains, along with the pitch sword and the bronze spearhead, support the theory that the steel bows originated from the weaponry warrior who, after being cremated, was finally buried with his equipment. The warriors in Stamna may have formed a social elite class that ruled local communities. The scale of their social power is debated, but it seems that it was based on the existence of a decentralized system of rulership. Regardless of how social rule was organized, the tubes and the material evidence testify that warriors played an active support role in the Iron Age Stamna society. But what are the characteristics that differentiate this particular social group from others? And how do these features constitute evidence of recognition and distant hierarchy while these people were still alive? To answer these questions, we must also take into account the biographies of the objects that have been placed in the tubes during the burial rituals. By studying ritual depositions using a biographical approach, we may be able to understand better the diachronicity of the burial ritual practices and the depositions related to treatment, selection, and selective placement of artifacts. Warrior burials in Iron Age Greece are defined by the existence of at least one sword among the great gifts, usually of the long now type, suggesting the power of some to take lives, usually accompanied by a spearhead. In Iron Lemos reference to exceptional burials, it is mentioned that also axes, silk bosses, and rowheads would be included. According to her reference, were there in Stamna any barriers that could be characterized as exceptional? What is the hypothetical scenario? The warrior barriers in Stamna were accompanied with iron swords, 
spare heads and knives. In only one case was used exclusively a now two type bronze sword, which was found into a narrow cis grave where two inhumations were put on top of one another with common orientation. Unfortunately, we do not have a single photo of that grave. The dead who was placed on the two floor seemed to embrace the higher place with his left hand around his neck. The bronze sword was found next to the dead in parallel position. As far for the exact position of the swords found generally, it's worth mentioning that they were found diagonally arranged on the chest of the dead, which they accompany. So you can see this barrier and in this one. More specifically, the number of weapons found in the cemetery of Stamna is remarkably small in relation to the number of graves investigated, which suggests that the locals were not placing weapons as offerings in the graves of their dead. We are talking about an era where peaceful conditions were ensured by the existence of a sufficient number of weapons. It was safer to keep them at home. So, the decision of the deposition of this particular weaponry in the graves, intact or destroyed, marked the dead as prominent in comparison to the rest of the deads. Most graves contain fewer than two weapons, with the exception of the two 378 with the bronze cauldrons, inside of which five weapons were found, and two 11, which contained four. Finding single weapons and tools and graves does not identify the dead safely either as males or as warriors. Finding, however, characteristic weaponry, swords and spearheads in combination is catalytic, as this combination differentiates their holders, providing them comparatively this quality. The urn number six is a representative example of the cemetery other study. So regarding the weapon containing graves, only a few can be securely attributed to warriors, who at that time held a significant place in the social hierarchy of the Stamina society, whereas the rest should be viewed as ordinary soldiers or weapon owners. This differentiation is possibly based on burial customs that are reserved for the warriors in relation to the rest. Those customs incorporate three successive stages. A, cremation of the dead. B, placement of the cremation residues in amphorae, tribe of pithos, bronze cauldrons or basins, and C, embodiment of the cinerary vessel in a built structure. So, if all these three conditions are met, I repeat, cremation of the dead, placement of the cremation, cremation residues in aqua, et cetera, gross cultural surveys, and C, embodiment of a cinematic vessel in a built structure, then the identification of the dead as a warrior is more secure, but not absolutely reliable when it comes to the gender. If so, we have to proceed to an anthropological um, study. The limited number of weapons found agrees with our view of a society that possibly did not consider it necessary to uphold an organized army, but maintained soldiers and guards conducted frequent patrols around the mountains as well as sea passages within the settlement territory. Waves in order to avoid lessening of the weapon surplus. Neither of the, of the aforementioned theories can be verified at the moment. Men or women warriors. Since the stamina material has not been ontologically analyzed, we cannot positively identify the skeletons as main warriors. Although ontological analysis of related barriers in Athens and Cadiz is very comprehensive and suffices to conclude that weapons and main barriers corner spot, unlike the main barriers and weapons, we assume that accordingly the same applies to stamina. However, until osteological research is carried out, 
one could take into account other possibilities. For instance, if Agelia Papi and Sergio Chetafilu recorded Marcos cases of elderly women's burials demonstrating customs that were attributed at event to warrior burials, a fact that could be interpreted as an act of honor to women of significant social status. Additionally, it's worth referring to the study of skeletal material from the Mycenaean tomb in neighboring Patras, location Calitea, carried out by the anthropologist Susan Fox on behalf of the archaeologist Evangelia Papadopoulou. The research focuses on a skeleton that belonged to a woman whose pathology indicates that she was probably a horse rider. The great goods, the anthropological study, according to which the body showed signs of very good nutrition and health, and the location of her body between two other women of the same average age indicate a socially superior personality. In this perspective, the debate on this issue remains open as far as the thesis under discussions concerned. Four killed weapons were found in the cemetery of Stamna, including a sword and spur hit in the abstract tube, accompanied different barriers, as well as a sword in top 32 and a knife in top 322. This practice is usually interpreted in the context of a religious ritual. Following a different scenario, this practice can be interpreted as having the weapons intentionally destroyed for any number of reasons, from politics and religion to acts of violence, as Matthew Lloyd states. He continues, most of the researches are referred to these objects with the term killed. So these objects were considered once as alive. According to Despero, the idea that these weapons were killed is based on a parallel with Northern European culture in which weapons were given names and personalities and were thus killed to accompany their owners to the afterlife. Following this rationale, we could argue upon the findings of the absidal tube that the interpretation of the act of bending the iron sword and the spearhead could be also linked to a belief that an object so sacred and strongly connected to its master has fulfilled its purpose and its use comes to an end when the warrior passes out. The clearly symbolic action of bending ensures that this weapon will never be used by others again as that could be perceived as an offense to the deceased. This is not the time and the place to solve the problem related to the buried and killed weapons found not only in Stamna, but also elsewhere in Greece and Europe. But then, sacrifice of weaponry as a social device connected with warfare and combat that represents rites of passage, allowing people to transform from warriors to other social roles is non-negotiable. Perhaps the Stamina society thought an accident of warriors as a special social group that needed to be emphasized through their weapons promotion during their afterlife journey. Based on the deposition of weaponry, we should also consider the possibility that the Stamina society made considerable efforts to enhance the status of the disease are participants in warfare, emphasizing not only their charismatic status after death, but above all, enhancing this status while they were still alive. The importance of the typology of narrow two swords as compatible armament of military officials since the Mycenaean period, introduced from the center of the Mediterranean and the Italian peninsula, has already been discussed a theory which is reinforced in stamina by the coexistence of other personal belongings, such as, for the example, the golden in the cycle, you can see the pink cycle, the golden hair ornaments, a uh, single pin, iron pin, a few uh, bronze fibula, uh, an uh, iron dodger, and the bronze and iron spearheads. Um, 
degrees are of Italian typology. All these uh, can be included in the group of individual objects of Italian typology found in the ancient Senate of Stamina. And we return to our main question. One may further note that there are various types regarding the iron bronze and territory of the Stamina weaponry. The evidence to date probably supports the theory that this is an isolated site that remained rather unaffected by the changes provided from other areas, according to iron bronze workshops, as if all these existed before or inherited. Of course, this is my personal opinion. The interpretation of the existence of weapons and jewelry of Italian typology could also be the result of exchanges in the context of peaceful contacts between Greece and Italy. For example, according to scholars in the 12th and 11th centuries, the objects indicating higher social status were mainly bronze weapons and to a lesser extent, gold and ivory objects. The possibility that they arrived in Greece as trophy items cannot be ignored either. As far as weaponry is concerned, we could also speak of warriors from Italy who brought with them the knowledge of the use of the new Italian weapons to Greece. However, in order to solve definitively the question of the origin of the objects, the isotopic analysis of the composition of the objects is required. Overall evaluation for monumental commemoration and identity. This is achieved. One, through the use of the Mycenaean Tholos tube. This element could also link to the role of the disease in the social political organization of the region. Two, through the barrier diversity, following the construction sequence of the graves, whilst taking into account their context, we conclude that the inhumed high rank officer of the Mycenaean period was gradually succeeded by the cremated high rank officer of the protogeometric period. The abstract tube is until now the only known example demonstrating this succession regarding architecture and burial practice. Three, through the variation of mortuary practice. Regarding the burial practice, the most distinctive differentiation is narrowed down to cremation vs. inhumation. Cremation took place outside the excavated clusters of the cemeteries, but the research until now has not produced much evidence about the process. The remains of the cremation were contained in real and handmade vessels, which rested freely on the cemetery between fiery residues, in cyst graves, and in specially designed built graves. Four. But what about the number and the variation of the offerings? As already mentioned, there is a differentiation in terms of choice of the burial process. As well, there is also variety and differentiation on mortuary practice that maybe was based to the family who used the occasion as a focus of display in order to demonstrate their social position and status. Allow me to put it more had been cremated. Usually, the body was hewn in a pit grave, a pithos, a kiss grave, a cis grave, and a vessel. When the deceased was a high rank officer, he was cremated, his ferraces were inert and were put mainly into bill graves. They inhumated or cremated dead persons were buried along with clay vessels, bronze and iron weapons, such as swords, spears, and knives, little horse, bronze and iron items, such as spin, fibula, hair rings, rings, bracelets, which were probably the personal possession of the deceased. The cremated officers who were in urban amphora or in large tripodic vessels or in bronze cauldrons and basins were accompanied by the same group of offerings, such as swords, dagger, spearheads, and knives. Other personal belongings of the dead, such as pins or rings, were put either into the urns or as in the grave six feet around the pithoid vessel, more specifically within the void space between the pithos feet and the wall of the built pit. In addition, we mentioned that in cases of cremation, none of the offerings, such as weapons, jewelry, or pottery, showed any traces of burning. An exception in the case is the case of this bronze cauldron, 378, in which weapons were burned 
and then per covered with cloth. And the last one, through the barrier clusters. The graves of all types and orientation were organized in 30 clusters. We can safely say that it's a long jolted necropolis of a well-structured population designed to fully exploit the space, creating a perfect cohabitation model attached to the opportunities and potentials of the region. If we would like to determine the overall character of these facilities, we would say that we have a peculiar urbanization without the urban. We would now like to return to the title of our discussion, saving life and death through tubes and artifacts. So how do we get along with all this got presented? We return to our first statement and its reply. Mr. A states, I think funerals are outdated and a waste of time. Mr. B replies, actually funerals are important rituals in the grieving process. They do not just recognize that life is ended, but also that the life was lived. Tubes. The tubes are the soul houses of the dead. Simple models of curving stones and pebbles where the abstract example typically shows a modest rural dwelling. Artifacts. First and foremost, they intended to provide the essentials for the afterlife, food, drink, all at home. Placing artifacts such as pottery, metals, weapons, beach, etc., in tubes is considered one of the most beautiful traditions because such a gesture represents death from a completely different point of view. What is that? No one is really dead unless he's forgotten. So the dedication of ordinary things along with the dead not only helps the dead to cross the passage but also the living in order to appreciate the life that the dead person lived. Thank you for listening. Thank you to, to you, Dr. Kistakopoulou, for this interesting presentation, a rich in uh, insight, uh, in suggestion. And so, is there any question in chat? You okay? Uh, I can be the ice breaker. Uh, so, I saw uh, it's very impressive that this variability of funerary rituals uh, in photogeometric period uh, in, in this uh, area. Uh, and so it's a different view um, from uh, the Northern Peloponnese. Is uh, which kind of images do you have about uh, this um, community in Stan, uh, more open in this period? Uh, without metal, so uh, they accept uh, metals from uh, Italy, from the central Balkan coast. Yes. Uh, which idea do you have about this uh, community, which in a solution, funeral solution? Uh, well, that's uh, a tough question that has to do, as we said before, uh, that has to do with the origin of the people. Who were these uh, people? Um, unfortunately, in Stamna, there is a marked discontinuity. We've, had, we've got the funeral architecture, we've got the findings, uh, and we've got the burial uh, rituals. And um, unfortunately, um, the excavations today, they have not provided the, uh, yet uh, with the, the data uh, for a direct uh, succession of previous or subsequent uh, occupants. Um, uh, so uh, we don't really know what is uh, the origin of uh, these people. And uh, we believe that the further excavation data will give us some um, answers about the settlements. 
And um, if uh, we have new data about the dynamics uh, of uh, the settlements, then uh, we, we found out uh, more about uh, who were these uh, people. We've got the Skiros evidence. Uh, the Skiros uh, is an island in the Aegean that has got um, funeral architectural findings and um, uh, very rituals that are identical to the one uh, the, the ones of Tama. So what has really happened? We can only make assumptions. Uh, there was a resettlement of people uh, where uh, uh, we talk about the, the Stamia com community. Until now, uh, 800 graves uh, were excavated, and uh, we do not know uh, where these people uh, came from and uh, where did they go. Because um, uh, we have to, to make clear uh, that um, after the destruction, if there was any destruction uh, of this uh, settlement, um, there was a total abandonment of the site and not uh, just uh, a, a reduction of the size of the settlement. So we've got the, uh, a large uh, um, a cultural group and uh, we do not even know how to name it. Yes, that's very interesting indeed. Yeah. 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 I would say burial areas and burial clusters, as you as you call them. Correct? Yes, yes, yes. Correct. Uh, burial clusters. Bur wow. Exactly. Um, I don't know if I maybe missed that from your presentation, but I would like to know if there is a diachronic evolution of the burial clusters. No. Are they occupied all together at the same time? Is there a sort of chronological evolution? Does it change something topographically? Uh, no. Uh, as I've told you before. Uh, we uh, got the Dab statue that is uh, dated back to the early protogeometric type, and uh, in 500 uh, graves until now, we've got only uh, five graves that belong to the early protogeometric period, and two that belong to the sub Mycenaean period, uh, early protogeometric, and all the others belong to the late protogeometric period. So there is a gap between the sub Mycenaean early protogeometric period and the late protogeometric. Uh, we've got um, five uh, graves of the middle protogeometric using uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the chronology, uh, uh, you know, uh, the typical chronology until now. So um, there is a large gap. Uh, what has really happened between uh, the early occupants and the later ones? We do not really know. So uh, there is. Uh, 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 from the 50 graves, to, from the 500 uh, graves studied, uh, the um, 580 belong to the late geometric period. That's, that's amazing. Okay. okay. The second uh, question? Yeah, second question is regarding the uh, warrior burials. So, yeah. so these are all. Uh, protogeometric, as you said, yes. uh, and late protogeometric, most of early to late. Yes, let's early say. To late. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is regarding the pattern of the area. What does it happen with uh, warrior burials, uh, warrior graves uh, after that in the area? Do we know? Is there a typical evolution as we see, for example, in other areas with warrior burials that tend to disappear going towards middle geometric and late geometric mostly when they tend to disappear uh, or is there no data to talk about that uh, is there um, i don't know if i understand the question uh, if there is a trend for warrior graves uh, in that region in that area since you told me that in trend, Stana, there is a trend oh okay um look um from the 500 graves uh, we've got uh, 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 at least uh, 10 graves mm -hmm. uh, that uh, could be um, a warrior graves, warrior graves, because we have uh, 
the three stages that I've told you before, we've called um, uh, the, the cremation of the, of the dead, the incineration of the dead, and uh, the, the way they put them into cysts or well um, uh, type graves uh, is a sign that uh, these people were different from the other one. They, they were high rank officers. Um, they um, uh, belong uh, to uh, a cluster uh, and uh, some top people put that, uh, put that war graves uh, with all uh, the, the other graves together. So when you find a single grave um, of a Pithos burial or a cis grave uh, next to, to him, uh, next to him, next to these burials, you will find uh, a warrior's grave. So um, maybe uh, this cluster uh, that was a family and um, this man or woman belonged to that uh, cluster. I don't know if that's a trend. I believe that um, uh, it's um, that singly um, uh, that cluster was uh, um, uh, be, belonged. It was more aristocratic cluster than the other one, and um, uh, there were a few uh, high rank officers. Uh, that commanded uh, all the others uh, in this region. Yeah. Are you planning to do ancient DNA to understand the ship relationships? Uh, yes, between, to I Ms. Mean, Walter, we, yes, because uh, we because have to find out uh, what has really happened. And if you read uh, about uh, their reports uh, of uh, the researchers, the reports of researchers uh, that um, analyze that property. <laughs> Uh, there is a huge uh, problem because uh, uh, the fabrics uh, do not belong to um, the early Iron Age period. Um, uh, one of these, one of these, um, one of the fabrics um, uh, is extended. It's dating this is extended between uh, 1300 to uh, 1000 BC, and the other one uh, from 1600 to uh, 1000. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, thirteen hundred. Yes, like we the, go. Yeah. yeah, we go back to the Mycenaean period. Yes, so uh, there's too much to excavate, too much to read, and too much to analyze. Uh, okay, but it's a fascinating context. Yes, it's, it's so a fascinating rich, right? context. Okay. Yeah. No. Yes, we've got this one. and uh, we believe that uh, they contained even burials. Uh, but uh, we did not uh, find any bones inside. Uh, I believe that um, uh, if uh, uh, there are um, if, uh, if we continue our excavations, uh, that uh, we will find uh, another uh, site uh, where um, various uh, from uh, children will be all together, because in those in those clusters, in those thirty clusters, we uh, found only two, three uh, graves, small seeds that uh, we are sure that uh, they belong to kids' graves. And uh, where are all the other kids, you know? So uh, we believe that um, in the large uh, territory, we've only excavated um, all this um, uh, um, area uh, that uh, belonged to uh, the last highway. Um, and, um, and now I believe that uh, large excavations uh, have to be conducted in uh, the areas up and down uh, all this uh, highway. Yeah. Without weapon, try barrel without weapon. I'm sure that uh, yeah, maybe. you will find uh, weapons and uh, more very rich ones. Uh, it's, it's very interesting yes. about the possibility to find uh, yes. uh, weapons in uh, female barriers, child barriers. It's yes. very interesting. 
question before uh, the policy is not known yet. Yes. By what you mean the play the game control and the light? The the play uh, the the first one you, you talk about the place they came from. No, I, I, we do not know. We do not know. Ethnically, no, we do not know. When we talk about the origin, we always talk about the, the place they came from. Yes, we don't know about, uh, we don't know anything and we don't talk about the ethnicity of uh, these people. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, and, uh, from my point of view, I'm going to say that these people uh, are covered about the origin. Yes. There must be a lot of uh, people in the area. If we judge from their pottery and uh, lady and so on, which is very much uh, in the tradition of, uh, let's say, the pattern pottery, like this kind of genetic ability. Yes. Yes, there is a connection, um, yeah. There is a connection. And uh, I, I feel quite positive about certain motifs and so on that appear on this uh, pottery, yeah. uh, which are very much related to the pattern uh, on the street. Yes. Uh, and uh, my question mark is always which um, a community created those particular motifs and so on, and how this, uh, you know, in. And, and, and uh, what I mean, there are motifs that we probably date a little bit from the that appear very strongly in the late for the genetic uh, sound, you know, and 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 we want uh, you know, uh, how to date these, but also, uh, you know, that the communities of history were in touch, yeah, obviously, probably created those sites together, and that they were basically until the late, they were not really yeah. shared so much. I mean, obviously, we have very little uh, else in the Pennsylvania, we have very little from here. That's where I'm the greatest, which Sandra is the greatest, but uh, possibly, yeah, uh, uh, in the cemetery because we have so much more. Yeah, it's a bit monotonous, I have to say, so it doesn't give us sense, but I can yeah. um, you know, understand me. But, um, you know, one point that I wanted to make is there must be a kind of book on yeah. the communities. Yes. And then we always have uh, problems about the communication about the yes. story of the students. Uh, Related to each other in the yeah. Well, uh, these days um, I'm in the middle of um, a study with um, a colleague of, of me. Uh, her name is uh, Elaine Simoni, is an archaeologist, and um, uh, we are in the middle of the study. Um, we want to make about these motives of uh, the pottery of Stamna, and uh, we're trying to find out uh, what uh, happens and uh, how these motifs are related to the other regions, uh, not only the close by regions, like I've told you before in the Tolia, in uh, the Ithaca Kefalonia, or um, uh, Akaya, or um, um, uh, the Skyros Sevistans, Lefka D. For example, um, uh, why do we have triangles and uh, why we have only wave lines and we do not have uh, concentric uh, circles? Uh, we have only one, one. Uh, we've got 709 vessels. Okay. Uh, we have got only one uh, vessel with concentric cycles. You go with concentric cycles. Yes, with in Stamina we've got only triangles. Why? So uh, yes, uh, these uh, motifs uh, are um, uh, well. Are uh, uh, I think uh, it's um, it's the way uh, to start one of those ways of. Uh, uh, we can use to uh, find out uh, what uh, really happened and uh, how uh, this uh, region was connected with the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, because the uh, senior DC, uh, the, yes, the control of the lacuna, as I showed you. Uh, yes, uh, so is this uh, an isolated place 
or is uh, a, a, a the place in the middle of, of a network uh, with the Adriatic Sea and um, Central Europe, why not? Uh, but uh, there's too much study that has to be um, uh, conducted in order uh, to find out. So please do your study. <laughs> and uh, if you've got something to tell me, well, I... Be glad to hear something from uh, you too. Thank you. I think we can finish this moment together and then I'll invite all of you in the little hour garden for the refreshment. And so thank you again, uh, Julika. And uh, we can uh, follow and speak about uh, Stamina with a uh, uh, left oh, that's very nice. I really need that. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Okay. And thank you again to uh, everyone on Zoom. Okay. Bye. Thank you.